Okay guys, so tomorrow is your unit 9 test and we want to go ahead and go over your study guide. So let's go ahead and get started. So number one it says draw a picture of salt. Now remember, salt, we're talking about table salt, is NaCl, dissolving in water. And then it says draw a picture of sugar. Okay, sugar is C6H12O6, dissolving in water. Describe what's happening in each picture. Make sure to use and describe the terms solvation and dissolution. Okay, so first things first. The difference between how salt dissolves in water and sugar dissolves in water is dependent on whether or not it's ionic or covalent. So as a quick reminder, something is ionic if it has a metal and a nonmetal. Okay? And the way you tell is when you're looking at the periodic table and you're looking at the staircase, metals are on the left side, nonmetals are on the right side. So if you have one of each, it's ionic. And if you have all nonmetals, then you have a covalent compound. So covalent compounds are all nonmetals. And key thing to remember, okay, so something to remember is hydrogen is a nonmetal, even though it's on the left side of the staircase. Um, so keep that in mind. So when we look at salt, you have Na and Cl. Um, hopefully you have your periodic table in front of you. Na is a metal, Cl is a nonmetal, and so that makes NaCl ionic. Okay, and C6H12O6, all nonmetals, so this is covalent. And so when an ionic compound dissolves, okay, it does two things. It dissociates, so it undergoes dissociation, which in this question is just, they use a different word, it's dissolution, okay. And the second thing is solvation, okay? Now, dissociation means to break into ions, okay? And solvation means to be surrounded by water, okay? So the key thing is that salt, because it's ionic, will dissociate, it will break into ions, and it will undergo solvation being surrounded by water, whereas covalent compounds will only undergo solvation. They do not break apart into pieces. So we know that if we're just drawing a general picture, right, I'm not a perfect drawer, um, but sodium is a metal, which means we know it has a positive charge. Chlorine is a nonmetal, so it's negative. Ionic compounds have positives and negatives. Okay, covalent compounds do not. And so if I'm drawing a picture of salt, okay, let's see, let's say salt, right? Positive and negative, and it's got negative and positive and negative and positive. So if this is multiple pieces of salt, right? all together. Well, if you add water to it, what happens is the positives and the negatives are going to separate. That's dissociation, when they break apart. Now, solvation is when water gets in the middle, and water is polar. So keep in mind, water looks like this blue structure here, okay? And it's polar, which means hydrogens are partially positive, and oxygen is partially negative. So if we're talking about attraction and things like that, we know positive things are attracted to negative things, negative things are attracted to positive things, okay, opposites attract. So that means the oxygen part of water is gonna wanna be near the positive part, and hydrogens are gonna wanna be near negative. And so water comes in and breaks them apart and surrounds it. And so oxygen in water is going to always point towards the positive part. And the hydrogens, oops, sorry, the hydrogens in water are always going to be near the chlorines, okay, or the negative part. So we can see that the negatives are near the hydrogen and the positives are near the oxygens. Okay, that's just kind of what it means. So this ionic compound dissociated, it broke the positive and negatives apart. Remember, it broke into ions, cations positive, anions negative, 
and it underwent salvation, which means to be surrounded by water. So both parts are crucial in actually dissolving an ionic compound. Now, sugar is a little bit different. Sugar, C6H12O6, actually looks like this. Let's see if I can draw it over here on the side. Sugar has an oxygen attached to carbon, 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 how many carbons? Oh, bad drawing. Looks like that. And then there's another carbon, and you've got a, oops, an oxygen, hydrogen, and a hydrogen, and an oxygen, and hydrogen, and an oxygen, and hydrogen. Let's see, C6, there's more. But needless to say, let's just say there's a lot of carbons and oxygens. And because it's covalent, it's not going to split up into, you know, all of these are going to separate into all bunch of tiny little circles, right? No. It's all going to stay together as one. And so what that looks like is, let's say I decide that sugar in my picture is going to be equal to one, two, three, four, five, six orange circles all together. Well, so that means if I have multiple sugars together, that means one, two, three, four, five, six. Then maybe I have another sugar real close by, and then this sugar is really close, and then this sugar is really close, right? Maybe all the sugar is on my spoon. But when sugar gets dissolved in water, what's going to happen is solvation. And so all of the sugar pieces are going to be separated from each other, okay? And water is going to be, water is going to be in between them. And because sugar is covalent, there are no positive and negatives, so it doesn't matter how the water is facing them. Some of the sugars have hydrogen nearby, some of the sugars have oxygen nearby. And if you can hear the grandfather clock in the background, I'm sorry. It just kind of always rings. The thing is that the sugars all separate from each other and they're surrounded by water, um, but they are not breaking up. You don't see all of the little orange circles. Um, so if we look at question, Number two, it says draw a picture of the solvation of KCl. So one thing to keep in mind is that is indeed talking about potassium and chlorine, not potassium, carbon, and iodine. Um, so we can say, okay, well, I know KCl is going to be ionic, so that means it will dissolve similarly to NaCl. We know that you're going to have a positive and a negative. Um, potassium will be positive, chlorine will be negative, and so if I'm drawing a picture of this, it's exactly what we drew in the first question where I have positive and negative, and I've got water separating them, right, with all the oxygens pointed towards what is positive, and hydrogens are surrounding what is negative, and that's the key thing there. Um, so if we look at question number three, like deserve, dissolves like, um, this comes from describing how polar solvents will dissolve polar solutes, okay, um, and that nonpolar solvents will dissolve nonpolar solutes. So this is crucial. It means if I have a polar solvent, it will dissolve other polar compounds, but not nonpolar compounds. Now hopefully you remember that water, H2O, is polar. But 
what you might not remember is why is it polar? So some, a key thing to remember is that something that is nonpolar is going to have perfect symmetry. Okay, perfect symmetry. So if you're looking at a compound, for example, CH4, methane gas. It's what we use to light up our Bunsen burners. Okay, if I take methane gas and I divide it down the middle, the left side and the right side match each other. If I divide it down the middle horizontally, the top and the bottom match each other. So because it's symmetrical, this would be nonpolar. That means it would not dissolve very well in water, which is polar, which if we look, water is symmetrical if you cut it down vertically, but horizontally, the top and the bottom don't match. So that makes it polar. So these two things are not going to mix well. Okay, And this explains why in question number four, which I know is not actually on your study guide for my students, I took that question out. That was kind of a mistake. Um, miscible means to mix. Immiscible means can't mix. So when we talk about oil and water, if we know that water is polar, it's a pretty fair assumption to say that oil is nonpolar. That's why they won't mix. No matter how much you shake up a bottle of oil and water, they will not mix. They repel each other. It is just not... It just won't mix because one's polar, one's nonpolar. Okay. Um, so question number five: Define solute and solvent. Okay. So remember, a solute is being dissolved. Okay. And a solvent is doing the dissolving. Okay. Now. The crucial thing of how you figure it out is if you're talking about salt water, almost all of y'all can tell me that water is a solvent and salt is a solute, but do you know why? Okay, solute, this is going to be your small amount. Okay, if I'm making Kool-Aid, I have less sugar than I do water. Okay, so solvent, which is the water in the Kool-Aid example, is your large amount. And so... If I have an example of salt water, salt is our solute, water is the solvent. I have more water than I do salt. Another way to remember it is that solute has one, two, three, four, five, six letters, whereas solvent has seven, so solvent has more letters, and it's the one that you have the more of. Okay. Um, if you have a solid like sterling silver, so sterling silver is a jewelry term, Plain silver all by itself is not good in jewelry, but sterling silver is. And so sterling silver is a solution, a solid solution called an alloy, right? Like bronze or steel or something like that. And I'm totally making this number up, but let's say it's 80% silver and 20% zinc, okay? Well, if I'm looking, I'm like, okay, well, I don't know off the top of my head. Well, I know that 80% is the most, so that would be the solvent. And my solute is zinc, so that would be the solute. It's 20%. It's not as much, right? If we talk about a mixture of gases, air is has lots of things in it. It's got nitrogen. It's got oxygen. It's got carbon dioxide, it's got dust. It has a lot of things in it. But surprisingly, oxygen is about 24% of the air that is in the world. Okay? And this is like all around, you know, including not just what's close to the earth, but up to the atmosphere. Nitrogen is about 78% of it. Carbon dioxide, I think, is about 0.4% around there. Okay. And so that means nitrogen is actually the solvent because it's what we have the most of. Oxygen, which we only have 24% of, is one of our solutes. And you could have multiple solutes, multiple things mixed in with the air, but you can only have one solvent. Okay. Um, so number six, explain three ways to increase the rate of solvation. So remember, rate of solvation just means speed to dissolve. 
right? So how do I make it go faster of a solid in a liquid? So an example of this would be how do I make sugar dissolve faster in a liquid? Um, so a couple things. First thing is agitation. Uh, the way that we do this most often is through stirring things, okay? When you stir things, it, the water comes in contact or collides with your sugar faster, more often, so it literally dissolves faster, okay? The second way is through temperature, so, if, well, increasing your temperature. So if you increase your temperature, the particles move faster, okay? And that means that they're going to hit each other more often, okay? And then the third thing is that um, you make sure it's in small pieces, okay? And what this means is that you have a large surface area, okay? So for example, again, you're going to get to see one of my beautiful pictures. If I have a cube, okay, this is my cube, and I have a piece of sugar right in the middle of my cube, is the water going to be able to dissolve that piece of sugar? Well, if water is trying to dissolve it, right, is trying to come at it from all the sides, it's going to have to get through all of the other waters in order to reach the one at the center. Kind of like, you know, the Tootsie Pop or like a Blow Pop, the um, little suckers, right? Like you can't get to the gum or the little Tootsie Roll part that's in the center until you go through the stuff on the outside. Okay, it takes a while to dissolve, but if you break it into a lot of small pieces, right, then you have a lot more sides exposed, and so higher surface area, smaller pieces, means it'll dissolve faster. And so if we look at Question number seven, what is the relationship between solubility of a gas and temperature? Remember, the word solubility just means amount able to dissolve, okay, at a particular temperature because it changes. Right? Well, key thing about gases and temperature is if you have a high temperature, then you have a low solubility of gases. Okay, whereas the reverse is true. If you have a low temperature, you have a high solubility of gas. Okay, and a perfect example of this is soda. Soda has carbon dioxide gas dissolved in the liquid. Okay, that's what makes all your bubbles. And so if you have two Cokes, right, like Coke number one, and you have Coke number two. Okay, if this one came from the fridge, so it's kind of cold, and this one's been sitting on the counter, and you open them both, they're both going to start to have bubbles come to the top, right, and come out. That's what we see all the time. Bubbles will come out. That's the carbon dioxide. Okay, but the one that came from the fridge is going to have more bubbles stay in your soda than the one on the counter. The one on the counter is going to have all of its bubbles come out into the air much faster. So your Coke is going to go flatter if it was warm, which is why your Coke is going to go flat faster during the summertime than it will during the wintertime if it's, if, you know, you're outside and the temperature of the weather is affecting it. And so if we want to increase, like, the, how fast we can get that Coke the soda into the coke there are a couple things we can do we can lower the temperature because we do not want the gas to escape and the second thing we can do is we can increase the pressure we all know that when you open a can of coke you hear the noise saying that the pressure has gone down right you've released the pressure okay if you don't keep your coat closed or unopened, right, all the bubbles will go out, okay? But that's why your can has pressure put on it so that as it travels from the distribution center to your grocery store, it stays carbonated. All right. So question number nine, describe how you would prepare 100 grams of a solution that is 0.5% phenolphthalein by mass. Okay, so here's the thing. As soon as you, well, as soon as you see 0.5% 
by mass or even just 0 0.5 percent like and we're talking about grams okay we know that our formula for percent mass is equal to the grams of our solute divided by the grams of our solution times 100. Now key thing to remember is your solution okay is your whole thing and inside your solution is your solute plus your solvent okay so both those things added together make up your solution so when we're figuring this out if I want to prepare something like literally I'm in the lab I have glassware I have a scale I've got graduate cylinders and beakers and all kinds of things we need to know what the ingredients are we need to know how much of our solute and how much of our solvent do we need and so let's go ahead and solve for the grams of our solute because that's part of our formula so I know that I have 0 0.5 percent and it's equal to our grams of our solute which I don't know divided by 100 grams of our solution times 100 now 100 percent the beautiful thing about this problem is that since I have something multiplied by 100 and divided by 100 they kind of cancel out um, and so do the percent signs over here percents and so what this means is that essentially for our grams of solute the amount of phenolphthalein we're going to need is we're going to need 0 0.5 grams of phenolphthalein which I'm just going to abbreviate this as P P T N P P T N. That's just how I'm going to abbreviate it. And so we have that many grams of phenolphthalein. Now we know that we said our total amount was 100. So if our solute, remember over here, is 0 0.5 grams, it means our solvent has to be everything else. So if I take 100 grams and subtract 0 0.5 grams, that gives me 99.5 grams of solvent, which they don't really say what it is, but it's probably water. Remember, water is our universal solvent. And so if I want to explain how I'm going to prepare this, the first thing I'm going to have to do is measure my 0 0.5 grams of phenolphthalein on a scale. Now remember, y'all had a quiz question where it talked about measuring a certain amount on a scale. and the only thing you can measure on a scale is grams. You cannot measure moles. You shouldn't be measuring milliliters on a scale. So make sure that your unit for your number actually matches up with what instrument you're saying. The second thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to measure 99.5 grams of our solvent, which is water. Now, key thing to remember is your density of water. So density of water is one gram per milliliter. You should know that from last semester. And so that means one gram equals one milliliter. So 99.5 grams is equal to 99.5 milliliters. So that means we're going to measure 99.5 milliliters of water in a graduated cylinder. Anytime you're using water, you should be using a graduated cylinder. Okay, and then we're going to mix them together. And you don't want to mix them together in your graduated cylinder, so let's just say in a beaker. That's a solid choice, okay? But the key thing here, the way that you could get this kind of question wrong on a test, is if you put 0 0.5 grams of phenolphthalein, but you accidentally put a full 100 grams or milliliters of water. That would be incorrect, okay? And so let's look at number 10, which is similar. It says, describe how you would prepare a solution of saline that is 25.3% NaCl by mass and has a solution mass of 1,430 grams. Okay, and this should say, remember, oops, remember that the density of water means that one gram equals one milliliter. So again, we've got our percentage, we have our total solution mass. So if my percent mass is equal to grams of solute divided by grams of solution times 100. Now notice, I'm right rewriting the formula, even if, though I just did it on my previous question. 
This is because I know A, I'm supposed to show all my work on math problems, and B, if I don't write down the formula, I could make a mistake. I put, could plug a number in the wrong spot by accident, even if I knew what I was doing. So my percentage is 25.3%, and I don't know the grams of our NaCl, right? Because NaCl is going to be our solute, and saline has water as our solvent. So the total grams of solution, though, is 1,430 grams, and it's times 100. So first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to get rid of this 100% part going to need to divide by 100 on both sides. Now the reason why we divide is in order to move the 100 over here and to get it away from what we're trying to solve, you have to do the opposite of math or the opposite math. So it was being multiplied, so we divide. So when we divide by this, we get 0 0.253 is equal to grams of NaCl divided by 1,430 grams. And so I'm just going to rewrite that over here so it's a little bit bigger. So 0 0.253 is equal to grams of NaCl divided by 1,430 grams. Okay, so here's what you do. We're still trying to get all the numbers on one side, all the letters on the other, one of the basic tenets of algebra. And so what we do when we have a fraction and nobody likes those is we cross multiply. We set it over 1. And we cross multiply and I say, okay, one gram of, well, I mean, multiplying by one doesn't really change anything, so we don't really need to write the one. Um, but it's equal to 0 0.253 times 1,430, which is 361.79. So that means in order to make the solution, I have to have 361.79 grams of NaCl. So step number one, weigh 361.79 grams of NaCl on a scale. Okay, now that means how much water am I going to need? Well, if my total amount was 1,430 grams and 361.79 grams of them are salt, the rest has to be water. So 1,430 minus 361.29, excuse me, 361.79 will give us 1,068.21 grams. So remember, that many grams of water, because of the density that we talked about earlier, since the density is one gram per milliliter, that means that is also equal to that many milliliters of water, which makes more sense because we use milliliters and graduated cylinders to measure water. So now we're going to measure 1,068.21 milliliters of water in a graduated cylinder. And step number three, mix together in a beaker. And we have a, a solution made. So that's wonderful. So let's take a look at number 11. Number 11 says to calculate the mass of magnesium chloride needed to make 0 0.350 liters of a 4.0 molar solution. So keep in mind, as soon as you see that M, you should be looking on the back of your periodic table for your formula that says molarity is equal to moles divided by liters. Because as soon as you do that, and we know that mass is grams, that's what we want, right? We want grams. Grams is not in my formula, but I do know how to change from moles to grams. Okay, so that means we know our molarity is 4.0. We do not know our moles, but we know that our liters are 0 0.350, okay? So again, what do you do when you have a fraction and you don't want one? You cross multiply. So our moles are going to be equal to 4.0 times 0 0.350, which gives us 1.4. So I have 1.4 moles of magnesium chloride.
but I don't want moles. I want grams. So I put it in a t-chart and I know that if I start with moles, oops, if I start with moles here, that means I need that to be repeated down here. So I write moles of magnesium chloride and I know that about moles of magnesium chloride, I want to change it to grams of magnesium chloride. Don't be tempted to make this into a multi-step problem. This is a one-step t-chart. All I need to do is change moles to grams. I'm staying with magnesium chloride, so there's no need for like two, three steps. But in order to go from grams to moles, that means I need to calculate my molar mass of magnesium chloride. So I've got magnesium and I have chlorine. There's one magnesium and two chlorines according to their subscripts. Magnesium, according to the periodic table, has a mass of 24.31 and chlorine is 35.45. So 1 times 24.31 is 24.31 and 35.45 times 2 gives us 70.9. So if you add them together, you get 95.21 grams. And that many grams is equal to one mole. That's what the definition of molar mass is. So that means we can put 95.21 grams here for every one mole. And that means we would have 1.5 or 1.4 times 95.21 divided by one, which gives us oops hold on 1.4 times 95.21 gives us 133.3 grams of magnesium chloride so that's how many grams of magnesium chloride we would need to weigh in order to actually make that kind of solution okay so number 12 says what is the molarity of a solution so again we see that word molarity we should be writing immediately on our paper, M equals moles divided by liters. That has 10 grams of KCl and 300 milliliters of water. You guys remember, 1,000 milliliters is equal to 1 liter, so that means 300 milliliters are equal to 0 0.3 liters. Okay, um, That's just something that you should kind of know is how many milliliters are in a liter. Milli means 1,000. So that's 0 0.3 liters. And so that means if I'm looking at my formula, I don't know M. Okay, I don't know moles, but I have grams, so I'll be able to figure that out. And my liters is 0 0.3. And so first thing we're going to have to do is do our t-chart. So instead of doing the t-chart last, this time I'm doing it first because I have grams. So 10 grams of KCl. And we're going to put grams of KCl at the bottom in order for our pattern to repeat. And our one mole of KCl on the top. And our molar mass of KCl, we have one potassium and one chlorine. We remember that chlorine is 35.45. Potassium is 39.10. And so they both stay the same. And so when I add them together, 39.10 plus 39.10 plus 35.45 gives us 74.55 grams. And that's equal to one mole. So I put that 74.55 grams there. And so that would be 10 divided by 74. 0.55 and that gives us 0 0.13 moles of KCl and since I have that I can just go ahead and plug it in 0 0.13 moles which means our molarity is 0 0.13 divided by 0 0.3 which gives us 0 0.43 as our final concentration Okay, now, question 13 says, explain how to use a volumetric flask to properly prepare a solution made from water and salt. So, key thing to remember, a volumetric flask, so you have a beaker, right? This is, you got a beaker, and it's got some lines on it, right? 
And then you've got like the graduated cylinder, which is the tall skinny one with lots of lines on it, right? So that's your cylinder. And then you've got an Erlenmeyer flask, this kind of this triangle shaped one. Okay, that's the Erlenmeyer flask. And it also has multiple lines on it. Okay, the volumetric flask is really different. Um, as y'all have said in class, it kind of looks like a bong. So it's got a long skinny neck and then kind of like a round bottom. And it only has one line, and that one line is on the neck. So if this is a 1,000 milliliter volumetric flask, then that line is where 1,000 milliliters is. So the way to properly make a solution is the first thing you do is you weigh how much salt, so weigh your number of grams of salt, which is NaCl, on a scale. Right, that's what you're going to have to do first. And then you're going to add it to the volumetric flask. And the volumetric flask needs to be empty when you add it. Because if you have already filled it up with water to the line, when you add salt to it, the water is going to go above the line. And so then the last step is you fill with water up to the line. Okay, you don't want to go over and you don't want to put exactly a thousand milliliters because if you're making a thousand milliliter solution, then not all of it is going to be water. Some of it's going to be salt, some of it's going to be water. That's the part of it being a solution. Um, so let's go ahead and look at question 14. So question number 14, if I can get the screen to move correctly. Question number 14 says, how does molarity affect the boiling point of a solution? Okay, so remember, molarity measures concentration. Okay, it measures concentration. And so when we're talking about boiling point of a solution, remember, one of the colligative properties that we learned was about boiling point elevation. That was a key word. And so what that meant is if you added particles to something, you changed the boiling point. You increased the boiling point. And so that means if you have a higher concentration, so high concentration means a high number of particles. The more particles you have, the bigger the change. So this means that they're directly proportional. Okay, so that means if you increase your molarity, you increase the effect on the boiling point. So the higher the boiling point is going to be. Okay, this also means if you decrease the molarity, you decrease the boiling point. Okay. Um, now remember, um, freezing point though has the opposite, which my screen keeps moving around a lot, so let's see if I can get this to fix. Okay, so with question 15, the kind of graph they're talking about is demonstrated in one of your other questions, but you ha if you have temperature on your x-axis and you have pressure, vapor pressure specifically, on your right. If you have a freezing point, okay, what that's saying, which I don't really like it being the freezing point, but freezing point, remember, when we talk about freezing point with these, okay, that's talking about our colligative properties of freezing point depression. Okay, and so what that means is if you have more particles dissolved in something, you're going to have a lower freezing point. Okay, you're getting further and further away from zero. So if you have pure water, okay, 
it freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Okay, now the other two that are options are KCl and barium chloride, BaCl2. Now, KCl is ionic, which means it breaks apart into two particles. Okay, so KCl has two particles when it dissolves. But barium chloride, when it dissolves, will have three particles. So that means that potassium chloride, well, I don't know, I'm kind of making this up, is around negative, so let's just say it's around negative five degrees Celsius, whereas like barium chloride, because it has three particles, will be even further away from zero, and it'll be at negative 10 degrees Celsius. And I'm making up the five and the 10, but you can see the point. Barium chloride has a more particles, so it's even further away from zero. And so what that means is with freezing point, your graphs are gonna kinda look like this. So if zero is here, right? So as kinda, kinda looks like this, freezing point, right? and then KCl and barium chloride is the third one. So the one, we know that barium chloride is gonna have the lowest freezing point. Pure water is going to be the highest because negative or zero is higher than a negative number. So the key thing about remembering that with temperature being on the x-axis is that high is over here and low is over here. So you're gonna remember thinking, oh, highest, lowest, and you're gonna think up and down, but you need to think up and down more like side to side. So if I look at just three points, this point is closest to the high side, so it should be water. But this point is closest to the low side, so that should be barium chloride, because we're talking about freezing. If we were talking about boiling points, it would be the reverse. The one closest to the high side would be barium chloride, and the one closest to the low side would be water. But since we're talking about freezing, it is the reverse. Okay. Now, question number 16. At 10 degrees Celsius, NaCl has a solubility of 35 grams in, in, per 100 grams of water. So that means at 10 degrees, you can dissolve 35 grams of NaCl in 100 grams of water. That's the maximum you can dissolve. Give a numeric example of a saturated, supersaturated, and unsaturated solution. Well, if it's saturated, okay, that matches your solubility. So solubility, saturated would be 35 grams of NaCl, right? But if you have an unsaturated amount, okay, then that means you've dissolved less than the amount you're able to. So we could say anything less than 35. So let's say 20 grams of NaCl. And a super saturated solution is going to be unique because it has to have two qualifications. One, it has to be higher. So let's say 40 grams of NaCl. But it also has to, be, all 40 grams have to be dissolved. So 40 grams of NaCl and all dissolved. Okay, now if they don't make the classification that is all dissolved, then you can't assume it's a supersaturated solution. Because if I have 45 grams of NaCl just plain, what that means is if the solubility is 35 grams, that means 35 grams are dissolved, but that means you probably have 10 grams thereabouts um, undissolved sitting at the bottom of your beaker. Kind of like when you have iced coffee and you have all that sugar sitting at the bottom, you have a saturated solution. You have a, you've dissolved as much as you can, but it's not super saturated because you still have a lot at the bottom. It didn't actually dissolve. And so that is a key thing there. So let's look at the next little graph. We are almost done with this study guide. So, using the diagram above, answer the following questions. So, let's see what they have for us. Okay, so it says, how much more solute needs to be added to make a saturated solution of KNO3 at 20 degrees Celsius if you have 25 grams? 
Okay, so here's the thing. KNO3 is the green line in our chart. Okay, and so let's try to look at our chart more carefully. If this would move, let's see. So if we're looking at this graph, I kind of wrote down what we needed over here so I could zoom in. So we have 20 degrees, which temperature is on our x-axis. So that 20 degrees is right here. And 20 grams is on the right side, so it's there. So the point where they meet is that purple dot. And if we're talking about KNO3, that's this green line here, which means I can ignore all the other ones. So currently, because it's underneath that curve at 20 degrees, it's unsaturated. And they wanted to know how much more do I need to be saturated. Well, a saturated solution at that temperature would be there, which is 30 grams. And if I already have 20 grams, how many more do I need to add? Well, I need to add 10 more grams of KNO3, right, in order to be saturated. So that is there, so let's take a look at the next question. So if I have 20 grams of KNO3, so we have the same line at 10 degrees Celsius, what type of solution do I have? So we have 20 grams at 10, and then it says, what about at 20 degrees or at 50 degrees? Okay, when you see a question kind of repeat only the last part, that means you keep the first part of it the same, so that 20 grams, and you just cha we're changing the temperature in our question. So let's go back to our graph. So we have, they want to know about our 20 grams at 10 degrees Celsius at, um, at 20 degrees Celsius and at 50 degrees Celsius. So if I look at 20 grams at 10 degrees, that's on my line. So that would be saturated. And if I look at 20 degrees, that is unsaturated. It's under the curve. And if I look at 50 degrees Celsius, well, that's really under the curve because there is whoop, all that space to the top of the line. So that is still unsaturated. Okay, so that's kind of how to answer a question. This is question number 18. This is question number 17. So let's look at question 19. It says define saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated. Tell how to determine each type of solution by looking at the graph. So unsaturated means that you have dissolved less than what is possible. Okay, so an example is black coffee. If you have black coffee, you haven't dissolved any sugar in it. You have the potential to dissolve, dissolve more. You just haven't yet. A saturated solution, saturated solution is when you have dissolved the maximum. Okay, that's possible. Okay, there's no more possible. And then a super saturated solution breaks the rules. It says actually. I am able to dissolve more than the maximum, okay? And I can dissolve more than the maximum because you heat it first, okay, so that all of it will actually dissolve, and then you cool it down slowly, um, and that allows the crystals to actually stay dissolved and separated instead of coming back together and just sitting like sugar at the bottom of a coffee cup. Now, unsaturated solutions are always under the curve. Okay? Super or a saturated solution is always on the curve. Okay? And then super saturated solutions are above the curve. But here's the key thing. If it says it's all dissolved. Okay? So what if it's above the curve and it's not all dissolved? Well, then it would be a saturated solution because what that means is if I have a 
coming above the curve, that means I've dissolved as much as I can, and I should still have a little bit sitting at the bottom, unless it's super saturated and I heated it first and then cooled it down in order to actually make it all dissolve. Now, question number 20 is a challenging question, but there are two ways to think about it. Okay, What they're saying is that it says a student collects the following data on two different solutes, okay, and their impact on the boiling point of one liter of water, okay, and there was a typo here. It should say boiling point, and so this concentration, that's molarity, right? So let's say I've got one mole, two mole, three mole, four mole, and five mole, and we have solutes A, B, C, D, and E, and they're saying what they did was they put these number of moles in a liter of water and measured the temperature that it boiled at. And the student was told that A through E was either going to be barium chloride, which is BaCl2, or potassium chloride, which is KCl. Okay, and so that means A through E have to be one of those two things. Now, when I'm looking at this data, one thing that sticks out to me is that 108 is the only one repeated, and it's repeated at two different concentrations. Okay, so when I'm thinking about boiling point, remember, we talked about boiling point elevation, meaning something that has a high number of particles is going to have a higher boiling point. And so if I'm looking at something that's 108, okay, barium chloride is going to separate into three particles right, because you have one barium and two chlorines, and potassium chloride will separate into two particles. And so that means barium chloride should have a higher boiling point than potassium chloride if they're at the same concentration. Well, none of our concentrations are the same, so that's not super helpful. But what I do know is that something that's at a 108 at a low concentration and something that's 108 at a high concentration Potassium chloride is going to have to be a higher concentration than in order to get to 108 compared to barium chloride, which since it has three particles, it won't need as high of a concentration. Now, for those of you who are like, Ms. Nichols, I know you just said that, but that still doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think you should put this into a graph in order to really see what that looks like. So if we just do a little simple sketch, so we put our concentration, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, on our x-axis, and we just start at like 102, this is 104, 106, 108, 110. Okay, if we just look at this, okay, and we graph. So at a concentration of 1, it was 102. Concentration of 2, it popped up to 108. Concentration of 3, it was at 106. Concentration of 4, it was back at 108. And then concentration of 5, it was at 110. And so what I can see better in a picture than I could when it was in a chart is that these four seem to be making a line. And this one seems to be off by itself. So what that tells me is that these are probably the same chemical Right? We're told that these are like either one of two things. So these are probably the same, and this is probably a different one. And so the key thing to be like, okay, well, how do I know which one is which? Well, we know that barium chloride should be should be higher, right, than calcium chloride or potassium chloride because it has more particles. And so if I look at my concentration of 2, well, where the line crosses at concentration of 2 is right there. So that's 104. So if I have a concentration of 2, one's got 104, one's got a concentration of 108, the one that's lower means that this should be KCl because it has less particles, okay? Which is why at a concentration of 2, it's got a concentration of 104. Whereas barium chloride, which has three particles, is at 108. And so I can see that that's how I can tell which one is which. Is I know that they're all the same because 
they are kind of in that line, and barium chloride is off to the side. So if I'm trying to identify A, B, C, D, and E as my identities, as my chemicals, I know that A is going to be KCl, B is barium chloride, C, D, and E were all KCl, right? Like they were all together. And so you could also say, okay, well, what if I don't have just one thing that's an outlier? What if you had two questions where, I don't know, maybe instead of what this looks like, if I can get things to erase, hold on. I'm just going to draw a new graph. Let's just say if I've got the graph, and I have some dots that look like that, and then I've got two that are like that. Right, these are all the same, and these two are the same. And in general, if we know that our concentration is over here and our temperature is over here, the one that's higher, if, this, if these are boiling, the one that's higher, so this one here, is going to be the more particles, and this one is going to be the lower particles. Now, if we have the temperature and concentration, and we've got, you know, um, those kind of lines, and it was freezing, right? If we're looking at freezing point, then it would kind of be the opposite look, and this line would have the more particles. And this one would be the smaller number of particles because it would have to have a higher concentration to be at the same low temperature. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. And the last question, because for me it's 6 o'clock and I'm really hungry and want to go eat dinner. Um, it wants to know which one is a pure substance and which one represents a solution. So if we say like our pure substance, like let's just call it A, is water, and then a solution with water as a solvent, that could be just like water plus anything, any sort of solute. That could be salt, it could be sugar, it could be potassium chloride, any, any of the chemicals, okay? So the thing that you need to remember is that when you add a solute, okay, a couple things happen. Your boiling point increases, right? It goes up, and your freezing point goes down. It decreases, okay? Now, when we're thinking about going up, going down, okay, remember, temperature, it goes left to right. So you can't really talk about up and down when really you should be talking about left and right. And so... One thing I like to do is I like to remind myself that high temperatures are on the right and low temperatures are on the left. So if I look at my graph, which I know that mine is black and pink and yours are just like two black lines, um, or it looks that way, is if I just look at this, I see that boiling, right? Remember, boiling happens, a vapor is the same thing as a gas, right? So boiling happens along this line. Boiling happens here because it's in between liquid and gas and freezing happens here between solids and liquids. So the pink line, if I just look at you know the tips of the black and pink line, the pink line is closer to the high side. So pink has a higher boiling point right now. And if I look at the freezing side, the pink line is also closer to the low side. So that means the pink one has a lower freezing point. And if I look at that, having a high boiling point and a lower freezing point means that there is a solute added. So that means the solution, so the pink line, is B, whereas the black line is A. So pure water whereas B is our solution. So hopefully this was helpful and you understand a little bit better. Study, do well, send me a message on Remind if you have questions. I'm going to go eat dinner, and I'm going to go do that.
So good luck, study, and have fun.